Hello again, everyone. This is Dr. David, and I'm here with Ray Solano, who is a pharmacist and re registered nutritionist, uh, uh, amongst other things. I believe he's, he studied nuclear pharmacy as well. So he has a wealth of information to share with us, and uh, Moira Dolan, Dr. Dolan, will be, all, will be chiming in from time to time whenever uh, when she sees fits. And I, I think it's going to be a very, very interesting pr presentation, uh, very, very helpful as well. Medication alone is not to be relied on. In one half of the cases, medicine is not needed or is worse than useless. Obedience to spiritual and physical laws, hygiene of the body and hygiene of the spirit is the surest warrant for health and happiness. This is by Dr. Hunt, who was one of America's first female physicians. And I think this is a very, very apt quote. But here's what I want to say, folks. This is not, we're not here to condemn allopathic medicine, not at all. I come from a culture and a background where uh, allopathic medicine, conventional medicine has saved millions and millions of lives. I, I know only too well how important conventional medication is. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you ask most people my age they will, who come from that background, they will say that, well, 80 um, I would say 80% of them will testify that they are alive because of uh, um, the use of uh, traditional medication, um, traditional medicine. However, the practice of medicine seems so focused on only one aspect, and so again, our goal is to help you to see the other aspects because they all fit into what we call the health equation. Again, it's an honor to have um, Ray Romano on, and that's Moira Dolan, Dr. Dolan, and she, like I said, will be chiming in from time to time, and. This is what Ray looks like. I think he still looks like that. <laughs> and I think so. You think so? <laughs> <laughs> and um, unfortunately, I will not be able to read all your bio because I will be because this is the screen that we will be using. His uh, we had a few problems with his presentation. So, uh, Ray, I'm going to bring your slides up, and I just want to say thank you for joining us on this presentation, and thank you for uh, being willing to share your wisdom with us. I'm just going to hand this over to you. Well, thank you, for David, for inviting me, and, and it's uh, just it's important that we get the word out and educate uh, all types of practitioners that uh, drugs have its play in medical uh, delivery and helping people, but they also have some risks. And so that's the basis of what we're talking about is that there's a risk with everything that we do that the body doesn't see as a natural substance. And uh, part of that is one of the, is is antibiotics, and one part of that, as well as uh, prescription drugs for a lot of chronic diseases. And whether there sometimes there's temporary side effects from these drug therapies that are d directly due to the drug itself, the majority of the long-term negative effects mainly come from nutritional deficiencies caused by the drug when taken over time. So what we actually have is that the drug nutrient depletions may actually be robbing your body of the energy and vitality exactly what it needs to heal. So the point is is that in many times that you require supplementation to be able to take out what that particular drug is. We're also going to talk about antibiotics, of how antibiotics have been of course, save thousands and thousands of, uh, of lives every year. There is some risks uh, involved with that, especially as, we, as we're using it in the food supply, because once we put it in the food supply, it is also getting into uh, animals, and we are, we are seeing that uh, uh, we're finding resistant organisms. Right, Dave, next slide. Now, the, the quick facts that, we're, we're, we, that we've seen here are, as, as you can see, the, uh, many of the microbes are developing resistance to these drugs. Uh, and these antimicrobials in humans and animals in agriculture are causing this uh, ground swell. We're seeing uh, even from tuberculosis, malaria, uh, common that they're unable to be able to treat with uh, with some of the simple uh, antibiotics we used to use before. We're seeing a tremendous increase in hospital cost 
due to these infections uh, and a number of uh, deaths that have been uh, that we are we are seeing, and this is even on the CDC's website. We're seeing uh, methicillin resistant uh, uh, organisms uh, staff are very common today. We're seeing the use of, of vancomycin, where uh, a very potent antibiotic, where it was considered a last resort now, sometimes mainstay. We're seeing a lot of it, even in the uh, in in eye infections. Next slide. Uh, and on top of that we have a nutritional deficiency of our population. And no matter what uh, we ask people to do to eat uh, fruits and vegetables, they always go for the French fries. Uh, there was an article just recently in the New York Times that, that, that actually uh, spoke in depth about this. Is the, the norm is not to choose those fruits and vegetables and it's not voluntary at all. So, um, so we have nutritional deficiencies that people are starting out with. And it's well known fact that sugar has a negative effect on the immune system. So we're, we're, we are having um, lacks of, lack of these nu nutrients, but at the same time, we're having things that actually turn it, the immune system in a negative uh, in addition to it. Next slide. There's been a long time coming. We've seen that the, uh, these alarm bells have been going on for the last 50 years, where if you've ever talked to any pig farmers or any chicken farmers, you'll know that some of the most awful infections that they'll get from uh, that can actually uh, result in the amputation or loss of legs and, and also or, or arms, extremities from just the simple uh, cuts or bruises uh, while uh, around some of these animals. Uh, do many of them have just gotten to the point where they just don't give any antibiotics to their animals at all because these things are, are getting resistant. So we're seeing um, uh, this happening uh, more and more, and this is a good reason for to look for any consumption of any proteins that have been uh, grown in a safe or a, a sane environment, or that are that are organic, because those uh, that they don't carry some of those antibiotic resistant organisms. The thing that's very troubling right now is the the new uh, genetically modified salmon that may go for FDA approval any day now, and they're finding that these these eggs are all grown in antibiotic laden. Uh, uh, bras uh, or media that the, the, the actual reproduction has occurred. So uh, nobody knows this for sure, but I'm I am assuming that the, that the salmon that are grown that are genetically modified are going to have some antibiotic resistance just by nature. Uh, so we could have possibility of a whole aqu uh, uh, aquaculture that may be resistant to some of these organisms, which makes it just very very scary. Next one slide. Antibiotics and foods in Japan, the uh, Japanese government has stepped up the monitoring to, to look at the, the banned antibiotics in shrimp uh, over a period of time. So this is in the Wall Street Journal, so this is not something new, and you're going to see more and more governments realize that there's lots of risks in their, in their food supply, because once we once we uh, destroy the food supply, then we're never going to get the nutrients for the population. Next slide. We're seeing this a lot in children. This is where it really starts. And first, we're, we see once we give uh, a number of antibiotics to children for simple ear infections, we have the cycle starts. And sometimes it may not. Um, uh, ever return back to the normal bacteria flora. Uh, thousands of uh, children are, are treated with recurrent ear infections that may be allergies to milk, uh, wheat, dairy, and may not re they actually seem to uh, get better without the use of antibiotics, but it's very difficult to leave a, a practitioner's office without giving a prescription. So we're seeing this starts 
you know, the early introduction of antibiotics. That's usually what happens is the first child gets an antibiotic prescription which throws off the bacteria flora in the colon. Next slide. In 1974, as a published study showed, antibiotics at the beginning of a, a, a acute middle ear infection resulted in a greater frequency of recurrent ear infections. And anybody with children will know that they see this over and over again, that uh, they can, they see this uh, once they get one infection, they will probably uh, get another one. And we're finding that, like we said, that's usually an allergy. And uh, many times it's uh, it's pasteurized milk that's causing the, it, the problem. So these chronic ear complaints can be initiated by food or environmental challenges. Okay, next slide. We're seeing this for for bronchitis uh, as well, and everybody here, many people with sinus infections, uh, they are given uh, antibiotics. And many times these are all viral uh, infections. And since homeopathy is not really widespread in Western cultures, which is really the, one of the main, straight, the main treatments for some of these infections, we use antibiotics for, for uh, many times some secondary infections. Uh, but it is not, doesn't really fix the problem. So we say almost 70 percent of the uh, bronchitis and sinusitis is, are prescribed antibiotics. So you can see what that does to the body's natural defenses. Next slide. For instance, uh, some natural solutions is in massaging the, uh, the area of these station tubes facilitate the drainage of liquid. And a lot of chiropractors use this very commonly in their in their practice for for children, and it's bound to be very helpful. And we talked about the allergies uh, for wheat, corn, and dairy, especially for recurrent infections, uh, and also elimination of sugar, sugar drinks, fruit juices during times of infection, because this lowers uh, the body's immunity drastically. We even see that, especially the ultimate is cancer, because viruses love love sugar and actually get stronger. Next slide. Some treatment uh, alternatives, like I mentioned, homeopathy has been around uh, for uh, uh, hundreds of years. Uh, for the acute otitis media, belladonna, uh, uh, 30C or 200C has been very effective. Uh, also vitamin A for was very important for properly functioning immune system, and we find that this increases the integrity in the epithelial cells and the mucous membranes. So we low levels of vitamin A are important. Okay, next slide. Thymus capsules uh, have been helpful, and of course, uh, we all find that acidophilus and, or lactobacillus acidophilus or bifidus, a uh, quarter of a teaspoon two times a day at the first sign of an infection is very important to increase immunity, and especially if the person is exposed to any antibiotics. Our vitamin A, 10 to 20,000 units daily for three days has been shown to turn it around without the negative side effects of antibiotics. Next slide. Uh, so remember, we talked about nutritional deficiency. So once we give antibiotics or we're giving prescription medication, the uh, folks have, patients usually have a nutritional deficiency to begin with. So what does that mean? Um, Two-thirds of the diet is consist of alcohol and refined carbohydrates, sugars, and, and fat. Of the average, uh, we have a very compromised immune system and also it's almost a state of malnutrition. Next slide. We see that one of the biggest, you know, as we're starting out with children with ear infections, and then all of a sudden their bacteria flora is is compromised, and their immune systems, and they're also the ability to make serotonin and neurotransmitters, and we're finding that uh, we 
these children end up being spectrum disorder uh, patients, and we're finding that the drug use for ADD and ADHD in this country is in the billions of dollars. These are some old numbers. Uh, I think we the 2010 numbers have almost doubled this. Um, we're seeing that Europe has started to pick up the use of this. They've st they try to uh, stop it for many years. However, the marketing campaigns in Europe have uh, taken over, and they are uh, seeing a dramatic rise in prescription drugs for this ailment. Uh, we've also been able to document in the recent studies that the frontal lobes of the brain during the uh, prolonged usage of these drugs never really develops and actually prevents the, the development uh, and also the problem solving uh, ability of these children. That's the reason why they have a little bit difficult time assimilating into society. Um, but we're seeing more and more of these uh, patients. And we're also seeing them in adults as well. The biggest nutritional depletions for ADD drugs and all the stimulant drugs is usually coenzyme Q10 and also all the B-complex vitamins. And we'll go into that a little bit more detail later on. Next slide. The major nutrients depleted and all, almost all the prescription drugs is very simple. We see magnesium, zinc, B6, B12, vitamin B1, vitamin C, calcium, omega-3 fatty acids, CoQ10, and vitamin E. And also you can add to that list uh, potassium, melatonin, and also in folic acid. Let's take the first one. Uh, magnesium, it's the most abundant in the body. It's a cofactor in over 300 enzymatic reactions and required for nerve transmission, energy, muscles, synthesis of RNA and DNA. And 75% of the population do not ingest the RDA of 300 milligrams per day. And that's under the US Department of Agriculture. Most of these are found in nuts and vegetables. Uh, the richest sources and uh, and even raw chocolate and, and in seeds. So I think that uh, the important thing is for us to look at magnesium as uh, one of the the, the most uh, I mean, most abundant um, minerals and also the one that the body depletes of first. Next slide. Ray, could you just tell us a little bit more about uh, magnesium? What what it's used for? Okay, I, I know I know we it's it's important for the things you mentioned here, uh, but what does that translate to in the body when a uh, when a human, when a person is deficient in magnesium? Well, the, some of the 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 fastest the, I guess the the most the biggest thing we see is muscle cramping, uh, tingling of limbs. Uh, we also see palpitations. We see anxiety. Some of the hallmark signs for magnesium deficiency is people waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning um, and can't go back to sleep, uh, and then they, or, or they go back to sleep. Uh, so in, in, in interruption of sleep patterns. Um, blood sugar imbalances mm. are uh, many times magnesium deficiencies. So. Uh, and, and again, since it's such, it's important for neurotransmitter production. It's 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 a cofactor in so many enzymatic reactions. There's not a lot that goes on that magnesium is not a privy to. The biggest thing we find is lack of magnesium uh, is also found in uh, uh, constipation and the amount of population that is as constipation is, uh, is, is just enormous, especially from pre prescription drugs and all pain medications. All pain medications? All pain medications uh, cause, uh, excuse me, controlled substances or narcotics control, cause constipation, many times chronic constipation or impaction. So you, when you look at all of your senior citizens, you look at all your back patients, 
uh, there's a 90% chance they have constipation. Um, so that's the first thing we do to um, uh, help with these patients. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. And when we start looking at children that are taking prescription medications, they're low in magnesium to begin with because some of those foods are some, uh, not, uh, not on their favorite list. And, you know, this, it's very difficult for them to get it. What we also find is that we've, we, uh, mineral waters have been, kind of, have been shied away from in, in, in the uh, United States. Uh, for some reason, it was um, in the 40s. It became uh, pushed away for bottled water. Uh, we also found that it, uh, in, others, in other countries, mineral baths are also uh, very common. So unfortunately, in this country, this is not, very, uh, not a very common occurrence. Mm. Next slide. All right. The next one is zinc. Uh, zinc is also... Uh, uh, used in a lot of enzymatic reactions and we're finding uh, especially people that are chocolate lovers uh, can uh, reduce the amounts of uh, zinc levels in, the, in their body and we see a lot of we even seeing some formulas now that have uh, <laughs> starting out at two or three years old as toddlers and we're using chocolate flavor it was just just, just absolutely insane it's a crucial role in, in brain health, and it's required for um, essential fatty acids in, in the brain. Um, we see it as a good source of, of in eggs, lean meats, seafood, and liver. Of course, organ meats are a good source of a lot of minerals that are shunned in, this, in our Western world. But the CoQ10 is found in, uh, in, in heart muscle and a lot of not just iron in the liver, but also a lot of other key minerals. So uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot. There's not maybe not a lot of places that people go to uh, find some of these uh, these minerals without su supplementation. Next slide. Uh, we see this aggressiveness, in emotional instability low levels are uh, very common with, and also thyroid dysfunction is associated with low levels in, in, in uh, children and adults. So we, it's very easy to determine if you're low in zinc. It's called the zinc tally test, and zinc tally test is a diluted solution of zinc that is given if you taste it, um, uh, you will have, if it tastes like water, you're probably low in zinc. If it tastes a very sour or astringent taste, then you probably your levels of zinc are normal. So and again, it's very easy and very inexpensive. Uh, B complex vitamins are required for help metabolize sugar, um, and it must be replenished daily in the diet. It's not something the body makes. Is something that uh, is is essential, uh, and it's critical for energy production. <clears throat> Again, lots of the uh, foods that we have that are processed or fast foods that are heated, pasteurized, cooked, microwaved, overcooked, are all these uh, complex vitamins are very very temperature sensitive and they're usually gone. So it's where raw foods, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables are important, and many, uh, many meats uh, as well. Uh, we find a lot of teenagers that uh, are, st are started on birth control pills. Uh, the first thing that they have the next month after therapy is depression, and it mainly can be reversed almost immediately with a B complex vitamin, uh, and it should be standard with all uh, birth control pills. Uh, ADD patients uh, and are, are low to begin with, 
and then when they add this to them, they actually uh, their levels get worse. Blood sugars are uh, are reduced, and difficult the d inability to concentrate is 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 compromised because it's required for neurotransmitter production, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, especially dopamine for concentration, uh, is depleted. So we're giving medications that actually make the situation worse if we don't put uh, nutritional uh, supplements along with those prescription drugs. Well, what is it about birth control pills that makes them deficient in, in B? High levels of estrogens, estradiol and progestin, um, require a number of uh, B-complex vitamins for to metabolize. The body gives you, you take drugs in a, in a form that it's not, uh, that doesn't recognize and it has to metabolize it so that the liver can uh, uh, break it down and it requires, we think it requires uh, uh, huge amounts of these B-complex vitamins to uh, bring the levels down to a normal state and reducing the, uh, the reserves. Hmm. Omega-3 uh, fatty acids, we've heard of fish oil, but also uh, grass-fed uh, meats are also high in omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, it's important for the rebuilding of new cells and the functioning of, of cell membranes and the connectivity of electrons between cells. This is why it's so important for brain functioning. In many uh, children with depression and adults with depression are just don't have enough the proper good fats in their diet. And studies, Dr. Andrew Stovall's work using high levels of EPA, uh, uh, essential part of essential omega-3 fatty acids, has been shown repeatedly to, re to reverse depression. Uh, so these it validates that uh, these functioning of cell membranes is greatly improved with these omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, low levels trigger insulin resistance and inflammation. Um, omega-3 fatty acids are anti-inflammatory. A uh, uh, number of pre prescription drugs also eat up the body's uh, omega-3 fatty acids, and if they don't have enough to begin with, uh, they put them in a deficient state. What examples can do that of drugs that uh, reduce omega-3s in the body? The, the ones that uh, uh, we, we have seen the, the, the most of is the drugs that are used for, for diabetes um, it is common to get some of the pins and needles in their, in their uh, uh, in the extremities. Uh, we also see in, in a little bit in most of the drugs. Mm. Um, Ray, somewhere along the way, we would like to hear about what it means to be a compounding pharmacist and why your practice is a little different from the conventional pharmacy, pra practice sure. of pharmacy. Well, compounding pharmacy is nothing different than what pharmacy was practiced 50, 100 years ago, taking items that are naturally occurring substances or in bulk pharmaceuticals and personalizing it to uh, the medications for uh, for patients or animals or whoever, uh, but it's personalized medicine. Uh, doses are individual, the dosage forms are individualized, the flavors are individualized, and many times the right now the only available medications are the ones that are prescribed or made by a pharmaceutical company. Well, a pharma if a pharmaceutical company doesn't make it, it's considered that it's not available. Well, a lot of items are being discontinued, um, drugs because they're just not profitable anymore, but have, have therapeutic effects. So we're able to take all those uh, options and be able to give it to practitioners uh, in, the, in the proper forms. Also, we, we do a number of nutritional, we find that clinical nutrition at, uh, is also helpful for chronic diseases, so we're able to take preparations with therapeutic levels or clinical levels uh, for injections, topicals, oral, uh, whatever is uh, is required to bring the body's 
bodily systems back in balance. We, this has been the lifeblood of all the autistic community and spectrum disorders community around the world. So without compounding pharmacies, uh, the, they would have never, ever been able to reverse some of the uh, uh, awful consequences of autism. Interesting. Um, and acids, we see the purple pill has probably been even more disastrous on health. It was never really meant to be long-term. It was only meant to be short-term, to give the body a little bit of time to heal, change the pH of the, GI, of the stomach lining. Uh, it originally was the only method for reducing or healing ulcers that were now we know are H. pylori infections. But back then, they would give uh, uh, H2 blockers or these um, uh, drugs to reduce the acid, stomach acids. Uh, once they discovered H2 pylori, we thought that antibiotics would just take over. Uh, however, since then, we still see subclinical levels of H. pylori infections being treated with uh, Prilosec and Prevacid, which um, doesn't really ever, ever cause, fix the problem, but uh, results in lifelong uh, usage of these drugs. When we do that, the body has its pH levels of the stomach lowered and make them very, very uh, susceptible to parasitic infections, also for opportunistic bacteria infections. This is the reason why we think that as soon as we have a little bit of introduction of salmonella or a, a, um, a food supply that may be tainted, people actually die uh, because they just don't have any capacity to kill those, uh, uh, those bacteria. Much like the rest of the world who has very normal pHs, they're able to withstand almost anything that's ingested from the environment. The nutri nutrients that are depleted are folic acid, B12, um, calcium, iron, and zinc, and the thing that is, makes us a little bit nervous is Prilosec is one of the most we used to be one of the most popular drugs for infants for the uh, treating of colic. Um, we call it um, acid reflux disease now, and there may be in some cases um, uh, the the need for it, but we're seeing it. A widespread uh, and many natural substances can be used instead of it, gripe water, fig tree, but uh, mainstay has been Prilosec, which sets up the body to uh, uh, alter its pH for a long period of time. And we think this is the reason why we're seeing tremendous increase in eczema in babies. So it's um, clearly there's lots of alternatives besides this. Uh, as we talked about uh, antibiotics, uh, the biggest thing is friendly in, intestinal flora and also some of the most uh, common B complex, magnesium uh, and zinc as well. Diabetic drugs, uh, there's n n numerous uh, uh, drugs on, on the market and some of them have been, uh, have maybe taken off the market. Uh, because of some of these complications, uh, but glucophage and uh, and many of the uh, the call these biguanides reduce CoQ10 levels, which causes some anemia, tiredness, fatigue, cardiovascular problems, uh, birth defects, even some cervical dysplasia, uh, because of the reduced amount of folic acid levels. So. Um, there are other ways of doing it, but uh, this is very common. Antidepressants, Paxil effects are very common, uh, Prozac, the item that is, it blocks the production of 5-HTP. 5-HTP is a precursor to serotonin, um, so the body is not able to make enough serotonin on its, on its own. That's why people actually get better for a couple months and they actually get, uh, they actually get worse. So a 5-HTP should be given with all antidepressants at the first stage so that we don't uh, stop the body's production of, uh, 
of, um, of, of naturally occurring serotonin um, as well. Anti-inflammatories, the biggest one that we, we see is the alteration of uh, uh, folic acid, uh, selenium, and, 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 and zinc. Many times, especially if you're talking about some of the steroids, dexamethasone, hydrocortisone, methylprednisolone, you'll get a lot of magnesium and potassium levels. You get muscle cramps. You'll get a lot of electrolytes in, in balance because a lot of those corticosteroids require a number of those uh, trace minerals to for balance. Selenium is uh, is used uh, for detoxification of heavy metals, usually a, a dosage range up to 400, 200 to 400 unit, uh, micrograms a day, not very much. But when you start giving anti-inflammatories, uh, we reduce it to, to sometimes a dangerous level. Cardiovascular drugs, well, we've seen a number of these having problems uh, uh, with the CoQ10 levels. Uh, we see, especially in all these drugs that are calcium channel blockers, uh, will also reduce melatonin. <clears throat> now, melatonin is very important for sleep and for normal redu reduction of the aging process. So well, this is the reason why a lot of people with, on cardiovascular drugs have a hard time sleeping. And you'll see over a period of time that they seem to, along with other these drugs, they seem to age much faster because the melatonin levels are low. We should always give anywhere from 10 to 20 milligrams of um, melatonin along with these medications. Um, coenzyme Q10 is the spark plug for the muscles in uh, and especially the biggest muscle is the heart muscle. So we feel that any time there's a requirement for uh, lack of contractibility of the heart or blood pressure problems, we, we always would want to supplement with at least 100 milligrams of coenzyme Q10. Um, Ray, melatonin, uh, is, is, like you mentioned, is, it, it has to do with sleep. Um, is 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 this reduced? And I'm just stabbing in the dark now. Is this reduced in um, people who have, who work the night shift or the graveyard shift? They do. Their 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 circadian levels are off, and uh, their levels it's made usually starts meeting at 10 o'clock at night um, by the pituitary. So it does it is it is altered. So supplementation of melatonin of pharmaceutical grade melatonin uh, is really important is that there's different grades as well. Hmm. Okay. Uh, we talked about oral contraceptives and how they are <clears throat> deplete to B6, B12, excuse me, uh, vitamin B1 and B6 uh, levels also find that people are on a, on a contraceptives have a lower tolerance to alcohol. That's usually due to the thiamine levels or vitamin B1. So it's important for a multivitamin, uh, at least with the proper amounts of magnesium and potassium to keep fluid levels. We think that may be a reason sometimes for the uh, weight gain and uh, extracellular fluid that may be gained with oral contraceptives. I, I'd like to say something. This is Dr. Dolan. I just want to say something about the depletion of uh, nutrients with birth control pills. Um, it's been shown that long-term use of birth control pills, and that's five years or more, which is pretty common in our society, long-term use of birth control pills are associated with a much higher incidence of abnormal pap smears. So an abnormal pap smear is a swab of the cervix that is showing either precancerous or cancerous cells, and there's 11% of U.S. women that have abnormal pap smears, and we know that, it, that these abnormal pap smears are also associated with not only low folate that Ray mentioned, but low vitamin A, low selenium, low vitamin E, and low vitamin C. 
So if you put these risk factors all together, uh, it really looks like birth control pills for especially the long-term chronic use are causing you know, more than just a couple of deficiencies. We know that there's B vitamin deficiencies that they're causing, but that particular um, deficiency has not been associated with abnormal pap smears, but all these other vitamin and mineral deficiencies have, and it really does seem to be highly related to the use of, of these birth control pills for, for much longer than what was really intended when they were first introduced. Would you agree, Ray? That's right, and uh, we have seen that the long-term use over five years is very detrimental in the higher levels of breast cancer, and they were really meant for short-term usage, uh, not something to be given as teenagers uh, in a 13 to 14-year-old and to be stopped in, uh, until the 35 years old. Uh, but mm -hmm. this is, has been the case and been disastrous for many, for, for many, for many women. Wow. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dolan. Um, please chime in again. Um, okay. Uh, here's a quick I'm one. I'm learning a lot personally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me too. Me too. Now, here's a quick question. Someone says, do bioidentical hormones also contribute to depletion of nutrients? Well, they do. They, they, they do have a uh, bioidentical hormones usually given at levels that... Um, metabolically match the, the body's the body's needs as opposed to sometimes the super physiological levels that uh, are much much greater than what an individual would, would require so we think that there's a little less of a side effect with them and not a, that, that but many of them are uh, identical to the same chemical structure that the body sees so that's the body's able to assimilated and it's not such a much a a reaction to it so but you still have to you have to uh, supplement with that okay diuretics uh, we think that most of the time that uh, these patients can be assisted with uh, high levels of, of calcium and magnesium levels to relax those those muscles that are causing uh, many of the sometimes high blood pressure but it, it, when we're given diuretics to uh, force the kidneys to, to balance, we're seeing uh, large levels of coenzyme Q10 being released, as well as potassium, zinc, and sodium. And it's, not, it's sometimes a lot more than just a banana, which is not really the best source of, uh, of potassium. Um, but sometimes there's, there's some very, uh, very good electrolyte solutions that don't have any sugar in it that have these... Uh, these, these micronutrients in there to help balance uh, the negative effects of diuretics. And we see whether it's potassium steering diuretics that uh, reduce the calcium, folic acid, and, and zinc, we see uh, sometimes sexual dysfunction, loss of sense of smell, um, and also we see uh, tooth decay as part of a problem. The thiazide uh, diuretics, hydrochlorothiazide, uh, it's, it's very common. We see a lot of sometimes restless limbs, nervousness, uh, numbness or tingling the legs, or, or uh, tinnitus, uh, along with these other these other problems. Or, or and it's sometimes the biggest thing is just muscle cramps. So diuretics can just cause a tremendous amount of imbalances. Uh, because you're taking a lot of the good out with the bad. Cholesterol level uh, agents probably have more uh, negative effects than, than we can say positive effects. A recent study just came out of Italy uh, sh showing that it actually reduces the body's ability to uh, fight infections, and may be more susceptible to food um, uh, uh, pathogens. That may be the reason why we're seeing so many people susceptible to small amounts of, of contamination of the food. Um, so we, we, we find that, of course, the biggest one is coenzyme Q10, uh, which is, is the body actually makes coenzyme Q10 uh, to a small amount, and this, the statins actually block that uh, production. There's been over 900 studies showing that the reduction of coenzyme Q10 uh, with, with statins and 
and unfortunately, it's, not, it's still not mainstream uh, a supplement. And what we do mainly, if people cannot afford coenzyme Q10, we'll just give it to them because we don't want them to come back with some of the devastating effects from muscle weaknesses that we see in low energy and um, some of the cardiovascular problems. You just sometimes just don't feel good. Mm. It's something that uh, it should be standard. I agree. I agree. And it's uh, standard in uh, Europe with most of their drugs. So uh, with, 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 with statins, it is not in the United States. Maybe, uh, maybe sometime it's in a package insert in Canada. It's not even mentioned in the package insert in the United States. That, that, is, that is tragic, I would have to say. Because it's, well, we think it is. It's probably it's just that uh, they are not even um, uh, acknowledging uh, it as a problem. Muscle ram uh, muscular rhombosis uh, is, if anybody that's had that before, it is sometimes, lo it doesn't take, um, uh, it's not something that goes away very quickly. It takes months for it to uh, to reverse itself. Um, also, uh, we find that amnesia, or global amnesia, loss of memory, is is a side effect of the statin medications. It, so we're seeing a, a increase in uh, congestive heart failure, uh, and we're also seeing uh, increases in dementia uh, from the statins. So I think patients should be um, uh, should be watched very carefully the, to see if they just all of a sudden stop remember you know short-term memory losses things that they just just can't pop in their head because sometimes it takes a long time to reverse that mm. I just want to jump in here and just uh, mention again for, for myself as a, as a practicing physician and I really am fortunate to have uh, Ray and his crew at people's pharmacy um, available to me because in prescribing, I mean, look at all these medications that he's listing here, not just the cholesterol drugs, but the diabetic drugs that we give for heart disease and things like that. These are common everyday medicines. These aren't the unusual medications, antibiotics, etc. And to have a, a pharmacy that actually has, you know, staffed uh, pharmacists that are also clinical nutritionists who can uh, advise me as a physician and advise the patients and really go a long way toward what you know is my passion, David, which is informed consent. And, you know, when I have been in the position of telling patients who come to me on a statin drug from another doctor and I'm telling them about the risk of uh, muscle inflammation, neuritis, CoQ10 deficiency, and transient global amnesia, and they're telling me, well, this is first I heard. I've been on this drug for five years with my other doctor. How come he never told me? That unless that patient, you know, was, was at a place like, you know, a, a pharmacy like Ray, Ray Services or had a doctor like me, oftentimes it is the first time they're hearing it. So for physicians in general and for, <clears throat> excuse me, the patients especially, it's really great to have a very involved pharmacist like this because sometimes that's the only place that they're actually getting this crucial information. No. I've, seen, I've, I've seen patients, thank you, uh, that they, they'll sit there at the checkout counter or start talking to them and uh, they'll, they'll, six months later, they go, you know, I, and they start searching for words, you know, they can just, you know, the things just don't pop in their head uh, and you, you talk to them about it and there's usually they may not remember but their spouse is, oh yeah, they're forgetting a lot of things and they can be uh, tracked back to uh, when they started the medication. So it's just, you know, it's a risk versus uh, uh, reward, but losing memory is, is, is no fun. No, not at all, not at all. Now, quick, uh, um, it, it, it's tragic, isn't it, when uh, the, the very drug that's meant to, to uh, improve your cardiovascular health turns around to causing congestive cardiac failure. Well, and, and the scary part of it is everybody over 60 uh, the most popular, or all, 90% of them are taking at least one prescription drug, and the most popular one is the statins. Hmm. I understand that some 41% of adult Americans in the United States are on a statin drug. And, you know, I heard an interesting statistic a couple months back from an actuary. This is somebody who crunches the numbers about how long people live and things. And he said that while we are living longer, significantly longer, 
in America, we're not living longer independently, which is mm. almost a sentence worse than death. Mm. 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 That's, a, that's, that's a good point. Oh, take sure. a look at, okay, maybe we're, we're cutting down on, you know, somewhat, uh, not, not very impressively actually by the statistics, but somewhat on these, um, you know, the number one killer, which is heart disease, um, but at the expense of people who can no longer live independently, it's the trade-off that when people are prescribed this, it's not exactly explained to them. Well, what, what used to happen years, uh, in, uh, 50, 100 years ago is when they patients got old, they just, they're, all of their systems, bodily systems all collapsed at the same time. And they either fell over or they passed away very quickly. But now it's a slow process that goes on for years and years and years. And the first thing they do is they can't walk and they can't do, they can't take care of themselves. Um, that was never ever uh, seen until many, when we have the combination of nutritional deficiencies and tremendous amount of 10 to 15 drugs a day. Mm, mm. All right, here's a quick question on, on, um, on statins just before we move on. Uh, do you know if taking CoQ10 after the, after the muscle deterioration from statins will restore the muscle damage? Uh, we've seen mo a lot of people, it does reverse it, but uh, it may be go on for uh, a year or two for it to uh, fully uh, recover. Awesome. Dr. Dolan, have you seen uh, uh, any other uh, any insight well, on that? Well, the key is you can, you can, you know, once it starts happening, you can give all the CoQ10 you want. The key is still, uh, you know, in a new, in, in the fresh viewpoint, taking a look at how much of a risk factor for that particular person is the cholesterol as a single item. You know, do they have more like a problem with homocysteine where the treatment they actually need is folate, you know, rather than is their cholesterol a real problem? You know, when the National Cholesterol Education Panel voted to uh, suddenly lower the acceptable cholesterol level in this country, what the average consumer doesn't know is that there was tremendous scientific controversy about that, and something like eight out of the nine people on the panel were in the pay of statin manufacturers. <laughs> so, you know, we have levels that were not considered low a few years ago now being considered a huge health risk, and it's really blown quite out of proportion. So the first thing to do is to look at, is the statin drug necessary to begin with? And then, and then secondly, you know, what else can we treat their cardiovascular risk factors with? And thirdly, the CoQ10. So yes, anybody who's been put on one of these and it's been determined that they really need it, they need the CoQ10. Um, once there is some muscle damage, the, the manufacturer themselves said, that consideration should be given to, actually it says, if you're even suspecting it, you're supposed to stop the statin right away. Uh, and then once it's confirmed, they do not go back on a statin. Uh, so, you know, you really got to look at whether or not that's really contributing to, to their overall health picture or harming them. Most people think that cholesterol is actually, uh, has no purpose in the body, and it's, it, it's, it's there and it's required for, it's cancer protective. And as you grow older, it actually increases naturally, and it's required for all the all the sex hormones and steroid hormones. And we're finding that a lot of uh, uh, patients, their testosterone levels drop uh, because they're just unable to make those uh, their sex those proper sex hormones, mm -hmm. which makes people at a cardiovascular risk in itself because testosterone is is cardioprotective. So we can go on and on and on. There's so many complications of just giving uh, uh, a statins uh, without uh, the proper uh, application. Hmm. All right, the next slide. Uh, we are on it. Also, okay. Also, uh, I think we did this one here. Let's go to the next one. Did we? Okay. Uh, hormone replacement therapy. We talked a little bit about this before. Uh, these are many of the the ones that are listed here are are are, uh, are synthetic. That may not require uh, talk about exactly the the physiological levels uh, or progestins, which are not uh, the body doesn't see them as uh, as bioidentical, uh, and we see lots of complications from headaches, uh, uh, blood clots. Uh, 
and what we see the big, some of the biggest one that we see is folic acid deficiency, uh, which can be uh, uh, very damaging for cell replication. Okay, next slide. So if you look at it, and, um, for folks that are taking prescription medications, you almost have to ask whether they're healthy enough to take a prescription medication. Are you healthy enough for it uh, beforehand? Is because if they have poor nutrition to start with, it just may make the situation worse. And I don't think that's something that people really, really understand. And if you take a prescription medication, rule of thumb is you're going to lose three nutrients. And you probably, for every, the biggest thing we were being told, well, what about an interaction? We hear, we hear this a lot in the pharmacy. Well, do I have any interactions between these? And everybody is so concerned about interactions of drugs, but there's never one published uh, article about the combination of drugs and what it does for, for a patient's or for therapy. And we see it on the individual drugs, but very, very, very rarely besides antibiotic usage is combination therapy. So uh, we don't always have an interaction. Uh, and also, there's also nu nutrient interactions, nutrient depletions. So if you're on three prescription medications, you're, you're going to have lots of interactions. Uh, antibiotics are prescribed for many times for viruses and should be, and should be limited. Uh, and also, uh, we should also be out of the food supply uh, entirely, especially for, for many animals. Uh, many adults have worse nutrition after they start medication, and this is something that seniors is something that we really have to be concerned with. The way we treat our seniors in, this, in our society is just really awful. Uh, more and more medications are given to them, especially since the drugs are free now. Uh, we're seeing uh, enormous levels given to uh, seniors that were never un unprecedented before. With these, sometimes people come taking 30 prescriptions at a time. Oh my! Uh, oh my. Uh, many adults have deficiencies uh, in key nutrients with prescription medications. Uh, and many of them are just dehydrated after taking medications. So after you, they're, when they're dehydrated, um, we're, we're, we're seeing uh, toxicity and uh, actually being concentrated. So uh, we're finding that body's unable to eliminate some of these waste products because it's holding on to as much uh, water as it possibly ca possibly can. So, you know, there is, there's lots of consequences every time you take a prescription medication. And if it is, it is given, it should be given on a short-term basis and reevaluated uh, probably you know, every two weeks, whether it's necessary. But the, the, the old adage that you're going to take this for the rest of your life, um, I'll see you in a year, is probably the worst thing you can possibly do. I totally agree, and I end up inheriting a lot of those patients, and some of them because because your pharmacist sent them over to me after some other doctor made a train wreck out of them. Um, but you know, I, I I see so many people, and it's just so common for people to have um, sleep problems. It's very common in this society period, but it's especially common in people on on prescription medications and people who have chronic diseases. And I just wanted to to bring up a couple other things that I'm seeing in my practice. Let me know if you see this, Ray, of, of people that are low in their melatonin who are being treated for asthma or just for seasonal allergies with inhalers. Um, and people who are just being treated for either a specific arthritis or excuse me, just joint pain with chronic anti-inflammatory drugs. These people are deficient in melatonin. People on the SSRI type drugs like um, like Prozac, it causes a deficiency in melatonin, and and uh, and we have so many people that are on steroids, either chronically or intermittently, for for allergies and, and things like that. And, and all these people are low on their melatonin, and I I just see that that's a huge problem. And instead of just throwing melatonin at them, I like to reevaluate what their situation is and see if we can't pull back some of these medications and get them to start sleeping better. Um, and just just in that way, with, without adding yet another, you know, just not throwing a nutrient at them. Let's really look at what's causing it, you know. And most of the sleep medications that are given out there uh, actually 
deplete the body's ability of melatonin. So, and I mean, I think that's why we see this rebound um, where they really can't sleep when they're pulled off of the sleeping pills. They try to get off of them, and they have this rebound insomnia because they don't realize that they've been creating their own melatonin deficiency all this time. And I think uh, one thing to understand is that any prescription medication, it cannot be patented that it is a naturally occurring substance. I mean, it, it takes... You know, it's not a billion-dollar blockbuster. Nobody wants to put it on the market. So it has to be financially feasible to put on the market. And all prescription drugs that are patentable have to block something. They don't enhance something. So I don't know of any that increase something. That uh, uh, Most of them just block a process uh, and block a, a, a metabolism cycle. And what, when we block something, we cause an equal and opposite reaction somewhere else. And therein lies the problem. I totally agree. What, you know, what I'm really struck with is the major disorders that you, you just went through on your slides. I mean, high blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, ADD, infection, uh, diabetes. You know, these things, it's like all of these things, to a great extent, are nutritionally, are, are because of nutritional deficiencies to begin with. Yeah. And if we can just catch the patients at that end before they come into us on, you know, half a dozen or more prescription drugs and just handle their nutritional deficiencies at, at the onset, we may, we may stop this uh, train wreck from, from even building up. I keep on going back to the model that was practiced uh, years ago when there wasn't that many, was not any of these prescription drugs available. They were given uh, placebos. They were given uh, uh, naturally occurring substances that they didn't were familiar with, but they were given uh, items that were not very toxic to the body, and people just get, they got better. Um, yeah. And that's exactly what we're what we're talking about is is going back backwards and trying to understand what the functional cause of the problem, as opposed to putting something that's a foreign substance in the body. And people get better, and and that that's I think that's what we're all talking about, trying to have people live healthier lives. Exactly. Well, I I really like the. Um the quote from Hippocrates where he said, or supposed to have said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. And actually you find a variation of that quote in Ayurvedic medicine, you find it in American Indian medicine, <laughs> you know, all around the world the, you know, ancient tribes have come up to that conclusion which is, you know, and by food we mean, you know, nutrients. That's, that's sure. where, you know, all these things that we're talking about come from. That's right. And that, that it's only when there's a failure of that that the doctor even has any business or what used to be called a doctor, you know, coming in there to kind of uh, handle whatever, you know, was left after the traditional therapies didn't work. But we, we sort of bypassed entirely these traditional stable datums that have really sustained um, flourishing societies in other times quite well. And, and here we're seeing the entire uh, modern miracle of medicine, penicillin, now just go down the drain because of our overuse and abuse of it mm. in, in, in less than 100 years. I mean, in, in really about 50 years. So and I think it, we're going to see a lot of the other medicines go the same way. That's right. If they don't take away the nutrition first. <laughs> well, David, that's all I had for us. Um, any other questions? Oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, we, we will be fielding questions. Folks, go ahead and type in your questions. I'm just going to um, um, switch screens a little bit for a moment here to show you a couple of things. Um, let me just change my slide, change the PowerPoint here really quickly so I can, I can show you a couple of things. Um, Folks, go ahead and type in your questions. Uh, we'll be we'll be dealing with them shortly. Okay, there you go. I think I have it back up. Uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, these these webinars, like we mentioned at the beginning, are to give people as complete a picture of health 
as is possible. We can try, right? And that's what we're trying to do. And here, I uh, just wanted to give you a couple of tips on how to use our, our site. Uh, we do send out notifications every week, uh, Sunday, usually for the week, and then a reminder on Thursday, because we don't want to, to just, uh, what's the word now, um, overcrowd your email, your email boxes. But we might, uh, we, we, so we, we, we will send notifications from time to time. However, you can always go to our site, buildingstrengthwebinars.com. Remember to put that S and then just see what's coming up. On the right column, you can actually see the list of webinars that are coming up. And uh, all you need to do is hover your cursor over the title and then some more information will come up. And then you can see who's coming, who's going to be speaking. Alternatively, you can actually click, like tonight's webinar now, and, I, and I, I'm clicking on this for a reason, because I want you to see, uh, it's taking some time coming up. But uh, you can, you, this is where you're going to register, but obviously after this presentation, you don't need to register anymore, but this describes what, what Ray spoke about. And here's a complaint here. I'm getting the announcements after the fact. Oh, I'm sorry about that. You're probably in another part of the world or somewhere, but... Uh, you can come over here and leave your comments, and we encourage our presenters to also go back to the site and to just, out of curiosity, uh, read the comments that were made about the presentation. And so there will be questions there, many times there are, and you can the presenters can go there and answer some of those those questions. So this is a it's, a it's a good forum for you to come back and to to discuss issues, and we're hoping to build upon that. This is right now in a blog form. But we're going to try and create a forum where people can talk about several different topics and several dis different discussions can be going on at the same time. I think that would be pretty cool. All right, what else do we need? If, if uh, okay, um, feature presentations. We've, we've listed a couple of presentations in the left column where you can actually watch the full-length presentation. We have about six or seven of them, and they uh, and you can. I, I was actually at a friend's house. He has a PlayStation 3, which connects which connects with the Wi-Fi, and we actually went. It's hooked up to his plasma screen, and all we did was just went to we went on the internet, went to the website, and if we, could, we watched. Uh, I believe it was this presentation in high def on the plasma screen. I thought that was pretty cool. So it's amazing what where technology is taking us to these days. And so there are different ways. You don't have to sit in front of a computer screen anymore. You can actually watch it in your den or your living room and enjoy the, the benefits of it. So there are lots of things to be done with, with these. And, of course, uh, members have access to our, and that's the login there, members have access to our archives. We're closing in on 200 full-length hour-and-a-half-plus webinars, and these are all categorized on the left column, as you can see. Uh, everything from spiritual, mental, physical. Uh, well, obviously, we have a lot more where the physical is concerned. How the body works, what the body needs, toxins, when things go wrong, what you need to know about health, and of course, Dr. Dolan has done quite a few for us. And here's a special a special chapter. Here is navigating the healthcare system, how to work intelligently with your physician, because really, it should be seen as a partnership, and not just as you going to the going to the hospital the way you would take your car to the mechanic and have him fix work on work on it. You've got to go, go to the doctor with your questions and be sure to uh, have those questions answered. I know that's not always possible, but we can try. All right, enough infomercial. Let's get back to the presentation. And there we have Ray's contact information up there. And uh, let's, let's deal with the questions. Hmm. Boy, what happened to my... <laughs> what are my questions? <laughs> Hang on, just a minute, folks. We are, it's probably hidden behind there somewhere. Huh. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, that's Ray. <laughs> I hate this when this happens, folks. Okay. This this may be the problem. <laughs> okay. What's that? Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry about this, folks. We're almost there. Oh, boy. Okay. 
that really looks like a very, very busy board. Okay. Um, aha, I see it. All right, there we go. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. All right. Any natural suggestions, solutions or suggestions for getting up anti-acid anti such as alo um, for getting up anti-acids? And she is offering aloe vera or a pH, pH balancer. Would those be good substitutes? As an antacid, is that is that the question? Yeah, well, to, to, yeah, to get up antacids with using aloe vera or pH balancer. She's asking if if, if those would be good substitutes, I guess. I, I, I like I, I like uh, aloe vera. I think it's is very effective, especially if you get the organic versions uh, to to give up to some of the antacids. Uh, I have been it I strongly believe that we may have an underlying H. pylori infection. So I, th I think that's something we have to 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 look very strongly at. Uh, another company's orthomolecular makes a product uh, that specifically pyrocil that has been very helpful to get rid of this, these subclinical H. pylori infections. Uh, and some of the the preparations that uh, I found to be very helpful is uh, uh, a gemotherapy called fig tree that can be taken very often to help with some of the uh, uh, the, the symptoms uh, of getting off of the medications. There's a couple of other ones, uh, but I can't remember on top of my head. But the pyrocell is something you take with each meal uh, to help get get rid of that. At the same time, it also uh, gives a little bit of antacid relief. Okay. Well, you know, one thing that seems to work in about 80% of patients that I have that want to get off these antacids is is good old organic apple cider vinegar. Yes. And yes. it would seem counterintuitive. People are saying, you're asking me to drink vinegar when what I already have is an acid problem, but those uh, things like the purple pill, Nexium, just really deplete the, the body's production of acid so severely that they are not digesting anything right, least of all these these nutrients and supplements that we're giving them. So uh, oftentimes that's the first thing that I'm working on before I even suggest that they take supplements because they're just going to be a waste of money until we correct the pH in, in the stomach area. And it's just amazing um, how many people this works on. It, it works on, on four out of five people to have a, can, you know, take some apple cider vinegar and, and so dilute water and sip on it over the course of an hour twice a day. And if they can't really take the, the taste, they can sweeten it with just a little bit of juice, a little apple juice. Uh, yeah, some people it, just put a little honey in it. Some people honey. put a little, yeah, yeah. Just, just get, get past it, but it's very inexpensive. The Bragg's apple cider vinegar, vinegar is the best. Hmm. I wonder how that works. That'll be interesting. Okay. It, it actually, is a, we find it to be very effective as a weight loss remedy, uh, at least... Uh, two to three tablespoons uh, daily uh, in the middle of the day will help uh, metabolize fat very nicely. Hmm. Agreed. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, that's, that's the whole the point. It's, it's so cheap and um, I've heard of people taking uh, baths and just filling the tub up with soapy water and putting, uh, no, not, not soapy water, but just water, hot, hot warm water and putting the apple cider vinegar in, in it, and they just feel detoxified just by... That's interesting. Yeah, it is. Okay. What effect does 200 milligrams of Celebrex have on my system and on hormonal balance? Celebrex is, can be very irritating to the GI tract. So it, it's it, it, for some folks, I found it to be very effective as an anti-inflammatory. 200 milligrams is kind of a small dose, but we try to find understand why the joints are irritated and inflamed. And many times it can be toxicity or heavy or uh, that may be causing it. Sometimes it may be allergies to uh, to wheat or dairy. So we try to get to the uh, uh, the cause uh, of the problem. Uh, I usually like uh, high levels of uh, quercetin uh, containing uh, formulas as anti as anti-inflammatories or enzymes, 
Wogelzheim um, with rutin in it has been very effective um, to reduce the inflammation uh, sometimes much better than some of the um, without any of the negative side effects on the GI tract. Okay. Yeah, I just want to point out it's right on the package in for Celebrex that it's really only advised for very, very short-term use. And yet most of the people that we see on it have been on it for months and months, if not a couple of years. <laughs> and especially from what we saw with Biox, there's, there's actually some studies that uh, there's quite a bit of evidence to suggest that Celebrex also carries um, heart disease risk maybe not quite to the extent that Biox did, but the way they handled it instead of pulling their drug off the market was simply to put the manufacturer's warning that this is only for extremely short-term use, a number of weeks. It was so only really, actually, as Ray said, we've, we've got to find out you know, some other thing as to what's actually going on with the joints and how can we treat why they got inflamed to begin with um, rather than just uh, sort of chasing the side effects of the drug. Right, right. Okay, aside from statin drugs, what drugs contribute to dementia? Good question. Um, a lot of them um, can cause a def deficiencies in uh, dopamine production, and we find a lot of the ones that uh, decrease uh, B vitamins, uh, which stop the do dopamine production. Uh, where we are usually the ones that are being used as, as diuretics, uh, but we don't know of any classification of drugs that actually enhances or is, uh, can be directly correlated to dementia other than the statins uh, in, in such a widespread use. Dr. Dolan, do you know of any other, cla any other class of drugs? Well, you know, almost all of the psychotropic medications, psychotropic meaning a drug that's given with the intention to alter mood, emotion, behavior, or thinking, um, in long-term use actually can, you know, there's been studies showing that it actually changes uh, not only brain anatomy but, but brain biochemistry to a profound degree and to the point where even if you withdraw the drug, some of that stuff does not does not come back. Some of the drugs used for Parkinsonism, which Parkinson's is trying right. to get dopamine to, to work and to supply dopamine, actually can go cause you know the other direction to go. Um, the gastrointestinal drugs, of course, are uh, to a large extent uh, interacting with dopamine, histamine, and serotonin receptors in the gut, and these are the exact same uh, neurotransmitter receptors we find in the brain. So. Um, you know, the first thing when I see an elderly person who's got a change of mental status, first thing I do is look at their drug list. And it could be things given, you know, for their urinary problems. It could be drugs that are, that are given for their restless legs. You know, it could be drugs that are given for their, their blood pressure. I mean, you know, if, if you actually read package inserts, you do find mental effects um, in really on, on the list of almost anything. And the only, reason, the only way to find out if that's what's causing it in your own patient is, is to take them off of it. Um, but, uh, you know, Aldamet is, is a big one, an old tiny blood pressure medication we don't see used that much, mm -hmm. but you all still use Maxide, which is a diuretic. Um, the various sleeping pills, the, um, the antihistamines such as Tagamet given for stomach problems, um, Zantac is another one that, that can cause dementia, particularly in elderly people. So some of these things that younger people get away with, with using in elderly people uh, they're, they're way more sensitive to it. And here's the thing, that the, the dementia can actually present simply as depression or as just some slight confusion. I mean, we see that a lot with the blood pressure medication, some confusion. We see it with the diabetic drugs. Um, you know, we see it with a lot of the heart medications. Or they just may, may be depressed. Now, the tragedy there is, instead of somebody being a student really looking at their drug list and seeing a change in mental status and saying maybe it was a drug and it can be something as innocent as an antibiotic, given for uh, a urinary tract infection, something like Cipro. Instead of looking at that and saying, okay, this may be the drug, it could be his Advil or his Cipro or his beta blocker, they, they then just load up the person with yet another drug. They give them an antidepressant. Mm -hmm. Of course, that makes them too agitated to sleep, so they give them <laughs> a sleeping pill. So the next thing you know, you're just chasing side effects of drugs. Right. And, and you know, when somebody comes into me with a baggie full or a shoebox full of drugs, the first thing I do is, 
is I, is I correlate that with their symptoms. And I go, well, you know, actually everything that's here on the table could be causing everything that you're saying. <laughs> Let's take these away one by one by one, and we see the people brighten up and brighten up and brighten up. Hmm. Hmm. Boy, do we need more doctors like you. We sure do. Well, you know, I had a question for Ray. We have a lot of people listening to this webinar uh, that, that – um, Aren't uh, aren't in our area. We're both in Austin, Texas. How can people uh, find a compounding pharmacist in their own area? Because you know they may have gotten their prescription filled at Walmart or something like that. Um, but but how can they find um, you know a, a, a pharmacist like you or, or or like your staff at People's Pharmacy that are really interacting with the patients? Not something you really see at Walmart or or the other places where people are getting their prescriptions filled. Well, that's a good question. We find that most of the independent pharmacies uh, are actually uh, have more time to spend with the patients. Uh, many compounding pharmacies also have some nutritional training, uh, and they're much more service-oriented that can be able to have the time to interact. Uh, when they're in the chain drug stores, there's absolutely no reward for them at all interact with their patients. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it's important to develop a relationship there, uh, there in, in your community with some of those uh, uh, pharmacists that actually care and are willing to take on patients and build that triad, uh, triad relationship with them. And many of them are, 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 uh, are, are open to it. Uh, and many times they have, the compounding pharmacists have a lot of resources available for continued education and training. Uh, but many of the other typical stores are just used to just leaving and going home and, and starting another day. So I think there's uh, um, uh, it's, it's maybe somebody 30, 40 miles away, but uh, there's usually uh, one or two in each community, IACP, International Association of Compounding Pharmacists, Dot com is a good uh, website to be able to find a compounding pharmacy that it's a nationally it has some national association that's close by. Okay. Well, I also uh, wanted to point out before we end off here, David, that uh, Ray Solano is on the radio every Saturday on KLBJ 590 AM. Uh, Saturday from 5 to 6 p.m. Central Time, and I don't know if KLBJ is like so many radio stations today yeah, where they, you can actually stream it on the Internet. They do. It's 590klbj.com, uh, 590klbj.com. And you can always just go to our website, peoplesrx.com, and we have three shows that are, uh, that are aired every, Sunday, every Saturday. And you can you can either pick one of the shows from our website, and it'll stream. It'll link you back to the website. Uh, we start at 10 o'clock in the uh, morning, and we we uh, finish at six, and we got total of uh, any, I think it's two, four, uh, five hours of radio every Saturday. Oh, great, great, and that's on the internet. That's that's good. All right, we have a couple more. We have quite a few. Well, a couple more questions that uh, have been coming in. Um, and Ray, just let me know whenever you you feel you've had enough. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, okay. This has been. Uh, uh, where can I find a pharmacist slash clinical nutritionist? Well, the uh, uh, International Association IA. C C N no I A A C N I International uh, Association of uh, Clinical Nutritionists is a website you can go to as well, and they can uh, hook you up with a, a, a clinical nutritionist uh, in your area. As far as pharmacists that are clinical nutritionists, there's a, there's a number of us. Are around, and most of us are in Texas, uh, but we're scattered all around the country. Okay, great. All right, here's a, here's a question. My 66-year-old brother is on a statin. It's from Gary. Recently, he has been having dizzy spells. He also is on high blood pressure medications. What might he be lacking in a vitamin or mineral? 
what what age did you say? Sixty six. Sixty six. Yeah. Well, I think it's back to what we what we talked about. The co uh, coenzyme Q ten and magnesium and potassium are the first ones that come to my mind. And then you just have to really ask the question: Is what were the person's uh, level? Why were they put on the statin to begin with? Uh, and I think there's a very narrow uh, clinical indication of when this is occurring. It's almost like a last of last resort. Uh, we find that many people have extremely too high levels of uh, sugar in their diet and high glucose levels that uh, can be directly correlated to inflammation. Uh, and we find that once we we change their diet drastically to get rid of the sugar out of their diet, their their cholesterol levels indirectly come back down, and they lose a few pounds, and everything everybody's happy. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I would like to go ahead and jump in here and give people a uh, a resource for looking up some some drug interactions and and um, deficiencies. Uh, not, not, you know, it's not entirely a complete list, but it can at least give you a direction to go in, and that is worstpills.org, W-O-R-S-T-P-I-L-L-S dot O-R-G, and uh, it's, it's, just a, it's just a great resource for uh, adverse drug effects, and you'll find some information there that you, you really won't find on other websites, and it's uh, something that's... Um, a lot of good drug information for the lay person as well as for professionals, and it's it's put out by a public citizen, and it's uh, wholly funded by uh, donations from its members, with of course no 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 help from big pharma. Hmm. Yeah, and someone was asking about there used to be a book, a handout called "Drug Induced Nutrient Depletion ha Handbook," excuse me, and by it's not Ross, by Ross uh, Pelton. And it's no longer being published, apparently. Uh, you can, you can, uh, Ross Pelton, um, uh, it sh should be, and also the Metabolic Code Diet, it was jointly uh, published with doc, uh, James Laval, Laval Metabolic Institute. And look under the Metabolic Code Diet, and you'll see a lot of that information in that, um, uh, in his book. Metabolic code diet. diet. Right. Okay. By uh, Dr. James Laval. How do you spell that? L-A-V-A-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Okay. Laval Met Metabolic Institute. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, does testosterone supplementation have negative nutritional effects? Well, we find that um, uh, testosterone... Uh, it causes uh, imbalances in, in uh, found in potassium levels and in magnesium levels. So, because uh, 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 like we, we we mentioned before, the body has to metabolize all those uh, those hormones, um, and it's very effective for for muscle uh, muscle tone. So, we we always like to make sure that they're um, electrolyte levels are, are balanced and they're not short of, uh, I, I find out that uh, if they're deficient in magnesium and calcium, they may get themselves muscle cramps. Well, and also the synthetic form of testosterone, especially when it's given in the high doses for anabolic steroid use, can cause profound B12 deficiency. But just like we see with the female hormones, the, the deficiencies caused by the synthetic versions are are more numerous and more severe than, than what we can expect from the bioidentical. Hmm. Okay. Going through these questions because they just keep on piling in. Uh, boy, a lot of people have, have concerns like this about this. Okay, can you dis discuss the nutrients depleted by warfarin? Well, we think there's, there's just almost all of them. Of all the drugs that the uh, uh, anticoagulants are probably the, the worst in uh, depleting a lot of the nutritional since it's such a profound effect on the body. But we're, and the thing that's scary is that a lot of uh, people are just so afraid to take any supplements at the fact that it's actually going to be uh, causing a exasperation of the 
of the levels uh, of the um, uh, anticoagulants. We, 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 you can be safely, uh, we put the Co CoQ10 to it uh, with, the, uh, with any of the warfarins or Coumadins. We tell people to make sure that they get the prothrom prothrombin chimes uh, adjusted because uh, they have to get uh, levels taken uh, regularly. And we have, have people look and see if they can uh, switch or, or add natokinase to their, uh, to their therapies. The two of them do not interact. There's been no published studies that they actually, is, that they, uh, they actually do work uh, alongside each other, but it, just to be on a safe side that they get the prothrombin times uh, adjusted. So you can, if you have to have uh, that medication under the uh, advice of a practitioner, you take the smallest possible amount. Okay. Um, what is the nutrition medic slash medical side doctor mentioned for info, please? Uh, worst, Dr. Dolan, worst what was pills? You know, like pill, like the pill you swallow. Worstpills.org. Great, thank you. Uh, what natural nutrients can an 86-year-old take to low? Oh, oh, boy, uh, can I can't ask that. Sorry, Shirley. Uh, how how important is ingesting nutrients by food versus supplements? Well, food is, is much easier for the body to recognize. You need very mic small doses of those nutrients. The body assimilates them very well. So it's always best to do that first. And sometimes food-based supplements uh, have a better effect. But we find that sometimes a rotation between food-based and synthetic is, can be beneficial. But we always want, never want to have supplements take the place of, of food. So you know, the problem is our soils are so depleted across this country that you know it's been, it's uh, this is a data from the from the government actually that eating an apple today only gives you something like one fifth of the nutrients that an apple supplied just ten years ago. So, so who's eating five apples in one sitting? And, you know, and, and if you don't eat bread that was made from wheat that was grown in North Dakota, you're probably not getting enough selenium. And you know, it's, it's so, so ideally people would get it from the food, and that's how our bodies are made, is to obtain these nutrients from food. But because our food, even organic food, is often grown in depleted soil, that we do find ourselves increasingly dependent on the supplements, but as Ray mentioned, Plant-derived supplements are ideal, and there's there's an increasing um, availability of pharmaceutical-grade plant-derived substances, uh, you know, supplements rather than the synthetics. Um, but you know, as you said, there's a role for the synthetics as well. Right, and and uh, I'm, uh, it's quite impressive. Technology has how far technology has gone, like with things like the flash, freeze-dried. Uh, technologies where you can actually capture the, the the nutrients in the plant and preserve it and turn it into a pill without all the excessive synthetic substances being added to it. So, um, um, looking out for, I, I believe, the uh, plant-based nutritional supplements can also help go a long way. I did not know it, it could be beneficial to combine them, though, so that's new, new to me. Well, there's a lot of cofactors that are naturally occurring in foods that we don't really, sometimes we don't see in, in man-made supplements. So that's why sometimes smaller dosages are sometimes beneficial. Uh, it, it's uh, what we just, we want people to uh, uh, get in habits of trying to have good diets uh, and understand what they're eating uh, so that they uh, hopefully uh, could be able to not be damaging and, and counteract the effects of, uh, of supplements. Is there a test for melatonin levels? And is there a natural? Yes, there is. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, people can, you know, in fact, I get diurnal, you know, which is uh, several times a day I collect, look at the serotonin level, I mean, sorry, the, the mel yes for melatonin, right? Yes. Yes. Yes, you know, we can definitely check the melatonin level, and it's very useful. Some people are 
are just uh, really hooked on their melatonin and taking very high doses of supplemental melatonin. And I'm suspecting it's not good for them, but they really don't want to work with me in coming off until I show them their lab results. And they see where their melatonin is. Uh, it's called supraphysiologic, in other words, way, way higher than what the body would normally be producing. And you know, explain to them some of the side effects that can have. On the other hand, we can also show how their their circadian rhythm of their melatonin is messed up, and, and get them to to really um, be compliant with a supplement program that's going to correct that rhythm. So more times than not, I'm using the testing information just to to get gain the understanding and cooperation of the patient, even though sort of empirically seeing what they're on and listening to their story, I can guess the right thing to do. When we get the, the lab results, they're convinced that it's the right thing to do and they will cooperate with it. Did you say that melatonin levels are elevated? Yes, yeah, some people have very elevated melatonin levels when they're just popping the stuff all the time. Uh-huh. You know, the old thing, you, you, you find out that a little is good for you, and so you take a lot. You know, they right. read something really great on the Internet or something like that. So. Right, right. Now, and, what, you know, what, melatonin is a brain hormone. The, the, you know, even supplements are, are not free of side effects, particularly when you're talking about things that, that affect neurotransmission. Right, right. Mm. All right, um, let's discuss a couple more, and then we'll wrap it up for the night. This, I mean, amazing questions just, just keep coming in. Uh, someone wants you to remind to to repeat what you said about H. H pylori. Uh, the what some of the things that you recommended. Um, you, you said something about a fig tree, but you said something else. Well, uh, yeah, as far as the therapy for pylor or the the occurrences of pylor. The, the, the occurrence with the, the incidence of subclinical, very low levels of H. pylori, we find in some cases as much as 30% that may be causing many of the uh, acid reflux symptoms that people are having. So correcting that pH back to a normal level, like Dr. Dolan was saying, either um, using um, um, uh, apple cider vinegar will sometimes br uh, keep H. pylori, which is sometimes is naturally occurring, bring it back down to a normal level. Uh, we have found that, uh, uh, I think it's pyloracil by uh, orthomolecular is, is very effective in treating this when we have symptoms that uh, cannot be resolved. And also, uh, uh, I found that uh, fig tree is a, uh, is a, is a gemotherapy from uh, the buds of fig trees to be very effective in reducing and in, in repairing into the, the cells in the GI tract and stopping some of the, trying to come up with some of the symptoms or some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, burning effect that occurs with people that are having, trying to come off with some of these antacids. Okay, and uh, last question for the night. Someone was asking about the deficiencies of ant antibiotics. So well, I'm sorry, the other, the other thing I forgot to mention is zinc carnosine. Zinc carnosine has been very effective uh, as prescription drug in, uh, in Japan. It is now not available as a, as a prescription in the United States. Zinc carnosine has been very effective as an alternative uh, and very safe to reduce uh, these uh, uh, these side of these effects as well, and actually has been shown to reduce the inflammation and the effects uh, reducing the H. pylori as well. It's called zinc carnosine. Z uh, how do you spell that? Uh, zinc and then C A R N O S I N E, and uh, Zymogen has one product uh, in this country. I forget the name of it, but it's look for it's zinc carnosine. Okay, that's that's a, that's also an, an amino acid, isn't it? The carnosine. Uh, well, it is. It's a combination of those two, and like I said, most of the research has been uh, been done in Japan and been very very beneficial. Okay, great. Thank you. I, I was going to show. Someone was asking about the deficiencies of antibiotics. Okay, there you, there we have it. There. All right, I'm just going to leave that up. The biggest thing is in. in, in Intestinal flora is really with the imbalance is the main one we have to 
try to get, restore an, an antibiotic therapy takes a probiotic therapy takes two to three weeks post uh, to be able to bring it back to a normal level. Two to three weeks of taking a probiotic each day. Right. Boy, how many, how many people actually do that? Oh boy, that's so important. And I mean, this becomes even critical when you think that uh, when when you realize that over seventy percent of the immune system lies right there in the gut. And it, that's right. So that's why we start out babies taking probiotics uh, at least after six months or sometimes earlier. Hmm. This is such important, such cr crucial information. Thank you so much again, Rick. Uh, for, for, for taking the time to do Oh, you're welcome. Be happy to do it any time. Well, um, <laughs> be careful when you say that because I may just take, I may just take you up on it. Okay. <laughs> actually, Moira was saying something about you, know, you both coming on to talk about, um, to actually discuss actual case studies and how you, you, you've uh, worked with patients together on, on different issues. And I think that would be a great, great uh, webinar to do. Yes, I think so. So we will be in touch. We will be in touch. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, and bye bye then. And folks, thank you for joining us. And you have a great evening. Remember, we have three more webinars: the one tomorrow, the day after, and the day after that. So this is going to be a power-packed week. Uh, God bless. Have a great night.